job. Thank you, Jen and Katia. Um, hey, everyone. So welcome to, to today's discussion. Uh, my name is Reina Olagues, and I'm the executive director of South Kern Sol. South Kern Sol is a youth-led journalism program focused on training the next generation of journalists and encourage civic participation to advance health and racial equity among vulnerable communities in Kern County. Our youth reporters who range in age from 16 to 24 years old are provided an opportunity to report on and discuss the issues closest to them and their communities. Our stories are distributed and made visible to the wider community via our website, southkernsoul.org and through traditional media outlets and print uh, media partners that we have in Kern County. We are so honored to be part of this important discussion and we would like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today's virtual town hall will feature a discussion on recent research on the lived experiences of LGBTQ adults in Kern County who face economic insecurity and how the findings can inform policy advocates and service providers working with LGBTQ people in rural communities. The goal is to hear a little about the findings for half of the time and then open it up to conversation. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Bianca Wilson is the Rabbi Zaki Senior Scholar of Public Policy at the Williams Institute at UCLA. Am I going, I think I'm going slower. Her research focuses primarily on system involved LGBTQ youth, LGBT poverty, and sexual health among queer women. She earned a doctorate in psychology from the Community and Prevention Research Program at the University of Illinois at Chicago and completed a postdoc in health policy studies at UCSF. Laura Divin is the legal director of the California Rural Legal Assistance Statewide LGBTQ Plus Program, which focuses on promoting and defending safe and equitable employment, housing, education, and access to healthcare for LGBTQ plus individuals in rural communities. Laura grew up in the Central Valley and retains strong ties to the region. Prior to joining CRLA, she worked for the Los Angeles HIV Law and Policy Project and the Shiver Project in LA. In addition to running a solo litigation practice in Los Angeles and Berkeley, Laura is a graduate of UCLA and Loyola Law School in Los Angeles and currently works in CRLA's Oakland office. Welcome. Now let's start with the first question. Can you tell us, Blanca, um, Dr. Wilson, can you please tell us about the project you just wrapped up? Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Antenna LA and uh, Reina and um, South Kern Soul. Um, and you can say Bianca, we could just go with Bianca, or Blanca, which, whichever one. <laughs> it's the same. Um, so yes, yeah, so the project that we're talking about today, the Pathways Project, um, is uh, was a study of LG, BTQ poverty um, that we actually conducted in Los Angeles as well as Kern County. And, you know, the idea there was to get representativeness across both urban and rural or non-urban spaces. Um, the project as a whole included both a big survey version, a survey part, and in-depth interviews that we did with people. And today, we're gonna to talk mostly about the in-depth interviews and what we found there. So for the interviews, uh, we spoke to uh, nearly 100 people across LA and Kern County who were all low-income or recently low-income um, LGBTQ people. And we talked to them about their experiences growing up and how they um, navigated, you know, poverty, being low income and their experiences. 
So um, I worked with a team of researchers who helped put this together and community members, um, our community advisory board um, of which uh, Laura and her organization were a part. Uh, we worked with these groups from both counties. And um, the, the Kern folks, you know, who were interviewed uh, were primarily interviewed by folks that we brought on that live there in Kern County, mostly from Bakersfield. So that's just a little bit about kind of where the data come from that we'll be talking about today. Thank you, Bianca. And I think everyone is wondering, right, how did Kern County get involved? Um, why Kern and LA? And, and I think uh, Laura is gonna answer that question for us today. Laura, can you please tell us about how you got involved with Pathways and what was CRLA's role and interest on this topic? Yeah, I'll let Bianca speak a little bit more to why LA and why Kern County. I think the idea was to capture an urban environment and then a, a less urban or rural environment. Um, so how we got involved at, at CRLA, CRLA is a statewide organization. We have 16 different offices in rural communities throughout the state, including an office in Delano and one in Arvin, both of which are in Kern County. Um, so the, the community advisory board was a really interesting part of this study because it was made up of organizers, community leaders, nonprofits, um, just community members from Los Angeles and Kern County. So it wasn't the researchers just deciding what they thought was important for the study, even though that's a really important piece. It was also the community saying, this is what we think is important. And this is what we would like to see you measure. And these are things that you may not have considered. So there was this back and forth between the community and the researchers, which is really rare, but really mattered to this study. And I think really um, goes to why the study is so impactful. Um, so we were honored to be part of the community advisory board. We got to meet and create a bunch of new connections because of that as well. We got to meet a bunch of really interesting organizers in Kern and in LA counties that we maybe wouldn't have had contact with otherwise. So I'm really grateful for the way that UCLA and the Williams Institute designed the study. Thank you, Laura. Bianca, do you want to tell us a little bit about why Kern and, and LA? Did you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. Um, so first, I think we we were thinking what's close to where to where I'm at, to be honest, um, doing qualitative research, like recruiting for in-depth interviews and um, being able to train folks who will have rapport with people you know, where people can trust them in the interviews requires a lot of time and, um, and a lot of money if we were to expand beyond California. So we thought um, for a project like this to do well, um, let's keep it close. And California is one of the most geographically diverse states in the country. And so while LA was an obvious for an urban center, one of the largest cities in the country, a city that has a lot of LGBTQ folks, we knew that our neighboring counties, particularly as we go north, um, were not large urban metropolitan spaces. And so Kern County made sense as an option. We also had worked already with um, some of the staff at CRLA, mm. um, uh, you know, a, a colleague of, of Laura's who had the position before her had been encouraging me for years to continue doing work that highlighted the needs of the Central Valley. So it was also a continuation of that relationship. Thank you, Bianca. And now let's get to, let's get to it, to what everyone has been waiting for. Uh, Bianca is going to explain to us and tell us a little bit about the bottom line findings that you think LGBTQ, LGBTQ focus groups need to know about. And then if Matthew can show us figure three, um, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Rena. So, I mean, you know, it's a big data set, as I said, and, you know, a qualitative study. So we learned a lot. 
about how folks manage problems with employment and money, um, you know, the money that is needed for basic needs like housing and food. Um, but one major finding that we're highlighting here is that um, we, we saw in the study that a lot of the people who participated had experienced poverty as children. So what I didn't mention earlier was that our study was focused on LGBTQ adults ages 18 and up. I think our oldest person was in their 70s. And um, so it was really a study of LGBT adult poverty. And <clears throat> what we noticed is over three quarters talked about some level of childhood poverty that they experienced. And, you know, so what I mean by that is their parents struggled with money when they were young, or they were homeless with their parents when they were young. They talked about not having enough food. So basically that we saw that the whole group of interviews could be thought about as really these separate groups, these different pathways into experiencing issues with money and being low income in that a half to, you know, a half experienced really major indicators, but about three quarters experienced some level of poverty as children. And then another subset, the remaining did not. And so how they started in their experience with, um, you know, having issues with money and experiencing poverty looked different for them. So even though each of the subgroups eventually dealt with a host of issues that affected one another. So meaning that what you see in the middle of this diagram, this kind of like third section, third layer, are like a host of major factors that people dealt with. Substance abuse, rejection from families, cycles of low wage jobs, and you know, never really meeting the, the money needs. Um, so even though everyone in the sample really talked about some subset of these factors, discrimination, um, how they got to that, how they got into that layer looked different for those who had experienced childhood poverty and those that did not. So that was one, I'd say, really kind of overarching finding of the study. Thank you, Bianca. And now to tell us a little bit about current a little uh, more um, in depth, um, Laura, can you please um, talk about how do some of the results Bianca mentioned reflect some of the work CRLA is doing and what you're seeing in Kern? So what we see is CRLA usually encounters people when they're at one of these intersections that the pathways study describes. So they've lost housing, they've lost a job, they're having mental health issues, they're having substance abuse issues. There's something happening when someone comes to a law office usually. So we get people at those intersections. And the biggest issues that we see right now in Kern County are immigration, education, housing, and employment discrimination. We see those over and over again in Kern County. And we see those over and over again throughout the state. It's not just Kern County, it's rural areas throughout the state. And when a person who is mid-income or, or, or mid-income um, loses a job or is evicted, it can have a huge impact on them. But when you're at or below the poverty level, having one of these crises can have a devastating life impacting effect and that's where we and other service providers hope to come in the there was a box on the last slide that said barriers and lack of adequate access lack of adequate access to services is one of the biggest issues in rural communities throughout the country and not having access to services can lead to ripple effects and adverse actions throughout a person's life. And in response to this study, we're taking a lot of different tactics. One of the things we're doing is developing a new 
um, questionnaire to go over social determinants of health on a lot of different levels so that we are we are seeing all of a client's issues all of a client's potential issues what the study made very clear is like people do not experience one adverse action they experience a cascade and so we have to capture that cascade so we're really grateful for data like this because it informs how we offer services to our clients and how we structure our work world. Thank, thank you for that. Um, and I think Matthew, do you have a graphic for us to, to see with, uh, to, I think there's a pull up bar graph from Quant Report here. Laura, do you want to explain the graph for us? Yeah, and, and Bianca, please jump in if I miss anything. Um, what we can see in yellow are the most extreme um, experiences of poverty in the community. And those are people who are bisexual women and transgender individuals. So transgender women, transgender men, non-binary, gender non-conforming people are experiencing poverty at 29.4%. And if you look to the left, you'll see cis gay men. So those are not transgender, cisgender gay men and cisgender straight men experience poverty between 12 and 13.4%. You contrast that with a transgender woman who is experiencing poverty probably at about 29.4%. It's a huge difference. We also see this difference in rural and urban communities. It's not on this graph. Um, but we see a difference between rural and urban communities as well among the LGBTQ population. So e those who are LGBTQ who are in urban communities make slightly more than people who are in who are LGBTQ and living in rural communities. So one of the things that this this graph shows us is that even though LGBTQ people make up between five to ten percent of the population. If you are a low income service provider like me, you are much more likely to see LGBTQ individuals come in your door than that five to 10%. You're going to see a much higher population because we experience poverty at a higher level. Thank you, Laura. Bianca, what have we learned about economic issues that is specific to Kern and potentially other rural areas? Yeah, and you know, part of um, part of that, Laura mentioned that you know, in our national report, and I realize we can put actually in the chat the um, links to the different reports that we're referring to today, because there's a few that have come out of the project. Um, but one of the points that Laura made, which is we know even just nationally, that LGBTQ folks in rural communities experience poverty at higher rates than those in urban um, communities. So that's one main thing. Mm -hmm. From this interview study, um, something that we saw was that even though a lot of the themes were shared across LA and Kern, so there are a lot of things that look similar, but a few things stood out that were different. Um, for one, um, you know, when thinking about our, how the kinds of things people talked about in the interviews, we saw that um, one topic that really didn't come up in LA that comes up in Kern is the role of farm work, both migratory and seasonal as just kind of part of the cultural and economic context that people were navigating that you don't hear about in LA from, from our interviews. And then um, in terms of you know, people's experiences, and I saw someone mention this in the chat just now, the, you know, the significance of services and the types of services available. And there we saw that our, um, that folks in Kern were more likely to say that they only had access to religious-based 
services related to poverty. So particularly like your food banks and your charitable food services. And in LA, there was a range. There were religious-based and, and secular, not religious-based government. You know, LA has like one of the largest, L, you know, LGBT centers <laughs> that provide services. So they had, in LA, they had access to religious-based and non-religious-based. In Kern, they were way more likely to talk about only knowing about religious-based services. So by itself, that doesn't have to be a problem. <laughs> except that many of the folks in both counties talked about problems with religious-based services and feeling like they were not affirming um, or just outright rejecting and discriminatory. So that really stood out for, those are some things that stood out for Kern. Thank you, Bianca. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, let's go to Laura, um, uh, you know, that, that graph, I think you're going to talk a little bit more about what are some of the policies and services that need to be developed or advocated for that speak to these findings. So one of the biggest issues we have in rural communities is access to services, which Bianca was just talking about, and it's something I want to circle back to because where food banks are run by um, only religious organizations, not all religious organizations um, discriminate against LGBTQ folks, but um, by and large, the experience has been that food banks um, are discriminating against LGBTQ folks and even more insidious are um, shelters that um, are discriminating against LGBTQ folks, primarily, again, transgender women are facing the most discrimination, transgender women of color specifically, are facing the most discrimination at shelters. And when you're at a shelter, when you're presenting at a shelter, it means you don't have anywhere else to go that night. Um, it's really, um, it's something that we are struggling with, we're grappling with as an organization, how to address this question because shelter is such a basic need, food is such a basic need, and to turn people away because of their LGBTQ status or to make them feel unsafe because of that status, um, it damages communities and it damages individuals. Um, we know that transgender people, for example, are more than six or six times more likely to experience homelessness than the general population. And high poverty rates for transgender people, and, and we, we went over the, the poverty rates for transgender people, which are almost twice as high as the general population. When you have a disparate impact like that, especially when as dramatic as the situation that transgender people face in employment and in housing and overall poverty rates, it means that our internal policies and services do not only need, need to be LGBTQ competent, they need to target those that experience the greatest impact from poverty and lack of access to resources. In most communities, again, the people that face the greatest burden are transgender women of color. As service providers, we need studies like Pathways to help us reimagine our services to better fit the communities that we are focused on serving. We are better because of, of, of studies like this one. I totally agree. Thank you so much, Laura, for that. Um, Bianca, what are some, what are the ideas that you worry about people taking away from the project? Right, I guess as, as researchers, we both are excited to get findings out, but also, you know, worry that people might take away the wrong findings, I guess. Um, so to that question, I think about how LGBT discrimination came up a lot. It was core. And this was both for trans folks and for cisgender folks, like in all these settings, homeless shelters, in housing, like with landlords, um, food services. And I do really hope that anti-poverty workers who don't normally focus on queer issues, take note of that. Because <laughs> like Laura said, they're there in your services. But I do worry sometimes that LGBT advocates uh, may look at the LGBT discrimination 
issues that were very salient in the study and miss how much participants of color uh, talked about racism, how many Latinx folks talked about anti-immigrant prejudice and barriers, you know, or even assumptions of citizenship status, um, issues with documentation, and the overall challenging challenges to starting adulthood with financial issues. <laughs> So I worry about those pieces getting missed. Like, as Laura said, when I think of many of the um, trans women in the study who definitely talked about uh, very explicit experiences of abuse and discrimination from services, some that were black identified said straight out, you know, I didn't know if sometimes what I was experiencing was because I'm a trans woman, because I'm black or because I'm a black trans woman. Like that there's, that there were aspects that were not only about the LGBT discrimination. So I hope just folks keep that in mind. Thank you so much, Vanka. And now we're going to shift to some additional questions from some of our youth reporters from South Kern Sol, and then we'll uh, shift to audience questions. So if you have questions, please start, start preparing them. Um, if we could start with, let's see, Maribel. Maribel, would you like to ask the question if you could um, share your video? There you are. Yes, hi. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for your work. Um, I look forward to uh, being able to use this in my own advocacy work and to help improve our community here in Delano. Um, but my question to you is, um, if you were to do this study again, what would you do differently? Mm, great question. <laughs> well, one, one thing that I would do, particularly, I think this is specific to the Kern side, is, you know, we did get participants from other areas outside of Bakersfield, but not quite as many, you know, as, as I would like. But I think knowing how challenging that was, that is like its own two to three year project that I actually think would be great to do. But, you know, so for folks who are in the audience, you know, Kern is a, a full county um, that has many areas that qualify as rural areas, but Bakersfield is more non-urban than it is rural, um, like the actual city. So, you know, yes, we have folks like from Delano, from McFarland, um, from Ridgecrest. So other areas were represented, but I think it would be great to, um, to, to do that. And, and yet at the same time, I acknowledge that the difficulty of recruiting in those spaces reflects the challenges that LGBTQ folks are experiencing. So, you know, I do think those were those experiences are represented in the study, but I could see the use of um, trying to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel, and thank you, Bianca. And now we'll go to Oscar Camacho. If you could share your video. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is, what are some concrete ways like you would recommend um, we could go about using research like this to advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. And um, kind of like a follow-up question to that is, um, how do we go about doing this in like some of our rural communities where sometimes there are like a lot of stakeholders or decision makers who are not necessarily supportive of the work we're trying to do? Laura, you wanna take that? Yeah, um, I think one of, the, it's a really great question, Oscar. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for me is making sure that non-LGBTQ providers have a level of LGBTQ competency and they understand reports like this one and what it means to have a 29% poverty level. Um, so as you're moving through the community and having those conversations, um, I, would, I would offer up training opportunities if you can to help share this information and share other information about just LGBTQ communities in Kern County, um, and I'm happy I'm 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 happy to talk about that further. But um, what I see in working with other providers is that 
um, a lot of providers say LGBTQ is not our population, not our problem. Mm -hmm. And I think bringing people into awareness that LGBTQ people are walking through their door every day, they just don't know, is incredibly powerful and important, and they need to know that we're here. Thank you, Laura. And now we'll go to, and thank you, Oscar, for your question. Uh, Viviana, and Viviana, if you could uh, share your video and tell us where you're joining us from. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here in Delano. Uh, my question is, um, how is um, anti-homosexuality legislation connected to um, economic insecurity? Poor folks tend not to matter to legislators, right? They just, they don't. Unless it's poverty specific legislation, um, poor people generally don't have a seat at the table. And if you're poor and you're queer and you're a person of color, if you have all of those intersections, you're very, very unlikely to have a seat at the table. So I think getting people into politics who have those intersections, who have those identities, um, making sure that they have a voice at the local level, going to school board meetings, going to city council meetings, finding a way to push in locally is really important. And if you have that space, if you've created that space, that you are inviting other people in who have marginalized identities. So if you have a space where you speak on the school board regularly, that you're inviting people in who are more marginalized. Um, Bianca, did you want to answer that question at all? Yeah, no, no, that's great, Laura. Um, yeah, thank you, Viviana. I think what I would add to that is just thinking about how many of our participants, how, how often parenting came up and struggles around childcare. And, you know, we had, you know, in addition to trans folks having very high rates of poverty, we see that too among cis bi women. And even though cis lesbians don't have higher rates of poverty than cis straight women, 20% is still really high. And these are groups that we're talking about um, the struggles of parenting. And I think that we need to be thinking about legislation that's intended to um, improve equity for pay among, <laughs> Uh, for, for women generally, uh, thinking about um, access to childcare so folks could work, um, you know, and, and thinking about those things too as part of a LGBT agenda within anti-poverty work. Thank you, Bianca and Laura, and thank you, Viviana, for your question. And we have, um, I, I think those are all the questions we have from our youth reporters at this time, and we're almost approaching the 115 uh, time. We have two questions from our audience. And the first question, um, thank you to the panelists. How can employers, including those who aren't based in Kern County, but may offer telework positions, be part of the solution to address LGBT rural, rural poverty? That's interesting. Laura, I'll answer it maybe from the data part. And then if you have other thoughts about it, I'm really curious. So. I mean, transportation was a was an issue that came up in both LA and Kern as like a barrier, but it often wasn't about a barrier just to get to work. It was a barrier in general <laughs> to get to um, to housing, you know, to to shelters to um, get their food. Like if people needed to use food banks, how to get to the food bank. And um, so yes, transportation to work came up, but it wasn't the only way transportation was a major barrier. Um, so to that end, I wouldn't, I don't think a lot of people talked about the kind of a lack of access on I, I don't think just the remote work would would necessarily take care of that. But maybe for some folks. I just think transportation was this larger issue that wasn't just about folks getting to work. It mattered, but it also mattered generally for reducing isolation, access to services, access to food, 
And so I kind of think about it that way, but I don't know, Laura, I'm really curious because it's also what jobs are people getting? People talked about, it wasn't just, can I get to the job, but the jobs people would hire them for were all underpaying, were cyclical, like, you know, they would quickly lose the job and not be able to get a new job. So I, I think that's interesting, but it sounds more like a remedy for a middle class, like, struggle more than I saw in the data for like low income folks, but that could be off. Laura, Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the data specifically, but but talking about employers and what employers can do for LGBTQ staff, um, a lot of the staff that we're talking about, the very um, low wage staff that we're talking about are going to be essential workers. So are do you have policies and protections in place for workers who are LGBTQ? Do you have a, a policy on pronouns? Do you have gender neutral restrooms in the workplace? Do, uh, do you train your, your um, staff on how to interact with LGBTQ clients? Are you taking those steps to be a good citizen? Um, are you taking those steps to make your workplace a uh, affirming and welcoming environment for LGBTQ staff and clients. Um, there's there's a few simple steps that employers can take, like putting pronouns on a name badge. Um, and again, those gender neutral restrooms make a big difference for people. Um, so as far as intersections with poverty and employers, um, know that just like discipline in schools, discipline in the workplace tends to disproportionately impact people of color. So before you write someone up, realize what you're doing. Pause. Um, and again, that's not LGBTQ specific, that's not poverty specific, but it is something that an employer needs to consider. Um, I have a lot to say about employers. Um, I'm a big fan of employers who try to do this right. And so few employers do. Most of the labor and employment cases that we see, um, which sometimes settle for significant amounts of money, are discrimination and harassment cases by fellow employees and by supervisors. That's what we see over and over again. So make sure that your workplace is not that workplace. Thank you, Laura. Great points. Um, would, could you guys, uh, could Laura and Bianca, would you guys like to stay for another question or do you guys have another commitment? I, I can stay. I'm happy to ready? stay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let, here's the other question from the audience. Could you comment on the disproportionate poverty rates among bisexual women compared to bisexual men, lesbian women, and gay men? Bisexuality is frequently overlooked in conversations about, about the queer community, and this disparity is striking. It is. Um, you know, an interesting thing, and we've talked a lot about this with the CAB and um, my colleagues, uh, re researcher colleagues on the project. I feel that this study <clears throat> answers more about what might not be the main <laughs> contributor than what is so what i mean by that is um among cis bisexual women in the study the lgbt related discrimination was actually one of the less discussed components so what we really took from that was that you know biphobia directly did not appear to be an issue like for example with employers it doesn't mean that it wasn't an, an issue um, in terms of mental health and think like that area. Cause I do think folks talked about internalized stigma, rejection from families. So bi women talked about that just like everyone else in the study. So, but in terms of the kind of material impact with employers that did not come up. So I felt it was useful in at least telling us that maybe less the route to focus on um, where among the cis, gay men, lesbians, um, less so also with bi men, 
So among the gay and uh, lesbian folks and the transgender folks, they talked about these experiences of discrimination in the workplace with housing. And when cis bi women did so, it was often because they were with a partner or a friend who was then perceived as gay and it was experienced that route, but often not directly for themselves. Um, and we know from other research that a lot of cis bi women tend to be more gender conforming, you know, so a lot is going on there that might make them less vulnerable to that employment based or housing based discrimination. So then we're still left with, but why? <laughs> and I don't feel like the, the study answered that, but I think it gave us some useful information that is relevant to how to think about differences between those groups. Thank you, Bianca. Laura, did you want to add anything to that? No, I didn't. That was really helpful, yeah. Thank you. And then we have one more question that just came in and it's about um, maybe how, how people could find good. What, what are some of those nonprofits in Kern County that people could find, um, you know, maybe nonprofits that support services to lower income LGBTQ plus folks in Kern County? Um, where could they be directed to receive support? So you can reach um, CRLA at CRLA.org. Um, we have offices in Delano and Arvin. And if you need specific referrals, those offices can help you find referrals if needed. There's also um, the Gender and Sexuality Diversity Center in Bakersfield, which is the LGBTQ center in town. It's a great organization run by great folks. Um, we really like working with them. Um, without knowing what kind of specific help you're looking for, like housing authority help or food bank help, um, it's hard to answer the question, but please reach out to Sierra LA and we will help point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, Bianca. And I would also like to thank Gloria Garcia for connecting South Kern Soul to, to this amazing study. And um, to all of our youth reporters for, for having your questions and, and you know, just be asking them. Um, we really appreciate everyone of you that joined us today. Um, please, uh, there, there was a link shared to the study so that you could read more about it. And, um, and just before we close, is there anything else, Bianca and Laura, that you would like to add? No, not now. Um, just thank you, everybody, and stay tuned. We hope to be having continued conversations like this that might be able to focus on other aspects of the study. And please check out the Williams Institute website. There are several papers from this study that you can um, uh, review there and let us know if you have questions. And please visit CRLA.org if you have questions about direct services. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the Williams Institute. It's so rare that researchers and direct service providers come together for these types of conversations. So I'm so, so grateful to the Williams Institute. And thank you to Antenna Los Angeles and Reina for joining us today and all the youth reporters. It was really wonderful to have everyone together. Yeah, it's a very unique partnership, Laura. I'm really grateful to partner with um, with UCLA, with Bianca, and, and that's why I think I kept asking about the Kern, you know, why Kern? Why did we become special? Because, you know, oftentimes we're not part of these larger conversations, but they're very needed and, and they need to continue for sure. Thank you. And um, I think that's all for today, folks. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.